Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Julian Lindley French, and I have the very distinct honor to be your moderator for this important session on the NATO Wales Summit, revitalizing the transatlantic bond. The panel is made up of the great, the good, and my old friend, Ariel Cohen. Great to see you, Ariel. Her Excellency Ina Eriksson Sarida, Minister of Defence of Norway. Welcome, Minister. Thank you. His Excellency and indeed host, Mr. Raimond Vionis, Minister of Defence of Latvia. Good evening, sir. Good evening. My old friend James uh, Aparatai, uh, Aparatai, Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs and Security Policy at NATO. Now, my aim is to have an interactive debate. But we're going to start off in a minute with a surprise. We have a taped intervention by Tory Newland from, from Washington, from the State Department in Washington, such as the importance of, of this event, this amazing Riga conference, and of course, this panel. Now, a few quick rules of engagement. Each of the speakers will make an opening statement of no more, no more than seven minutes. Indeed, after six minutes, they will each get a one-minute warning from yours truly, a kind of yellow card that I will not brandish. Because as we know, politicians and indeed James and Ariel can indeed bang on on a few occasions. So discipline, please, uh, everybody. To spice things up, let me challenge the panel with three statements and one, what is for me, a fundamental question. The three statements come out of the, the NATO Wales Summit. The first one read, quote, based on solidarity, alliance cohesion, and the indivisibility of our security, NATO remains the transatlantic framework for strong collective defense and the essential forum for security consultations and decisions among allies. The second statement also comes from the declaration and it reads, quote, allies whose current proportion of GDP spent on defense is below this level, 2% GDP, they will, colon, halt any decline in defense expenditure, aim to increase defense expenditure in real terms as GDP grows, aim, key word that, aim, to move towards the 2% guideline within a decade with a view to meeting their NATO capability targets. And my third statement comes from the Wales Declaration on the Transatlantic Bond, and it reads, quote, the North Atlantic Alliance binds North America and Europe in the defense of our common security, prosperity, and values. It guarantees the security of its members through collective defense, end quote. Now, in a sense, all three statements are linked to my question. A couple of years ago, I wrote a piece, in fact, I wrote a blog this morning that followed up on it, in which I posed for NATO the Riga test. The Riga test is simple. Can the good people of Riga sleep safe in their beds, sound in the knowledge that they are indeed defended collectively by their, by our alliance? So that's the question I'm going to park on all four of you. So hold the question for a moment, think about it for a bit. By the way, we are being broadcast online, so I'll be looking at some, some questions from the, the, the Twitter sphere, especially from younger members of our less grey audience uh, who will be invited to comment. But first, as I've said, let's hear what Tory Newland has to say. Katrina, where are you? Tory, please. Sveiki Latvia and participants in the Riga conference. Thank you very much to the Latvian Transatlantic Organization for inviting me 
to join with you today, just a week after our terrific uh, NATO summit in Wales. I think we all have a lot to be proud of with the outcome of the Wales summit, where we demonstrated uh, to our people that NATO is strong and prepared in this complicated, dangerous time to meet any challenge. As the President said uh, when he was in Tallinn last week, we will defend our NATO allies, and that means every ally. There's no such thing as an old ally or a new ally, no junior partners or senior partners. We will defend every single ally and its territorial integri integrity. Uh, the defense of Tallinn, Riga, and Vilnius is just as important as the defense of Berlin, Paris, and London. And we made that real at Wales with the Readiness Action Plan that brings NATO forces on land, sea, and air to the eastern edge of our alliance where they are needed most. The United States is particularly proud to have its own soldiers deployed in all three Baltic states, more than 100 in Latvia today. And we're also proud that so many NATO partners have joined us in these deployments. Latvia is a country that punches well above its weight and has for years in NATO deployments, whether in Kosovo or in Afghanistan, working with the Michigan National Guard in Liberia, and also contributing to EU missions in CAR and in Mali. And we are particularly gratified that the government of Latvia, along with uh, the government of Lithuania, has now made a pledge to be at 2 percent defense spending by 2020. Uh, joining the already strong showing in the alliance by Estonia. As important as our readiness action plan is, the other uh, initiatives that we made at Wales are also important to NATO's future, because even as we ensure that we mean what we say by Article 5 and the defense of allied territory is solid, we also have to continue to make a strong contribution to global security. The Enhanced Partnership Program will ensure that we continue to work uh, well and strongly with those partners who contribute the most to our alliance. And the Defense Capacity Building Initiative will allow NATO more efficiently and effectively to continue to export security training and defense capacity building to partners around the world, and particularly those on the other side of the Mediterranean, but also to our partners to the east of the alliance. Equally importantly at Wales was the strong statement of political and security support that all 28 allies gave to our partner Ukraine at this very difficult moment in her history. All 28 members of the alliance pledged concrete security assistance to Ukraine, either bilaterally or through the trust funds, and made clear that we stand with her in her uh, effort to protect and secure her sovereignty and territorial integrity, her democratic future, her European future. I also want to take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, allies for the conversation that we have begun at Wales about the importance of defeating the threat to all of our nations and territory that, the, uh, that ISIL now poses. As was discussed at the Wales conference, this co global coalition that we are building is going to take every single nation. And we were gratified by the strong statements of, of support that we heard at NATO, and now we have to turn this into concrete action. Military support to defeat ISIL, humanitarian assistance to those who are suffering, uh, working against uh, foreign fighters in our midst who are going back and forth and now pose a threat to European territory when they come home, blocking ISIL finance, drying it up wherever it is hiding, and countering the ideology of extremism wherever we find it. As we work to secure NATO territory within our borders, we also need to continue to make that strong global contribution. I'm very uh, gratified for the conversation that you'll be having there in Riga. I wish I could be with you in person, but I look forward to hearing about it. Thank you very much for having me by video today. Thanks. Thank you, Tori. Um, just to clarify one remark, you said collective defense for everybody but Scotland. But we won't go there. 
Minister Sarida, the floor <laughs> is yours. Thank you, Julian. What an introduction. Uh, well, Raimunds and I came a week ago from what we think is really the most important NATO summit in recent years. And I know that my colleagues, our colleagues, have been saying this for many years and many times before, but the difference now is that the security landscape is profoundly changed around us. And I think that our shared vision of a Europe whole and free has actually been challenged a bit by those who disregard the rule of law, for instance. And I think that we gave a very clear answer, and I don't think there is any room for interpretation on the condemnation on Russia's action that were given uh, during the NATO summit. And I also think that the way we address the instability in our southern neighborhood is something that we come out of stronger than we went into it. And we gave clear responses to the challenges that we do face at the moment. And the refocus on collective defense and the alliance being both ready to improve our readiness, but also our responsiveness is very important. We have, from Norway's side, advocated for more focus on collective defense for years. We started this with the core area initiative in 2008. And I have to say that for many years now, we've been pushing a bit towards the wall because it hasn't been easy to advocate that in NATO for some time. Now it's much easier. Now NATO has a response to what we've been asking for for some time. And also the fact that Norway, alongside other allies, have decided to deploy troops and forces in Latvia and the Baltic countries. Uh, we are now deploying uh, our parts of our Telmark battalion. Uh, we have a mechanized infantry company coming uh, at the end of this month, and they're looking forward to coming, doing exercise, Silver Arrow. They're doing training with the Latvian forces after the exercise is over, and that is something that uh, is important to us because I think that establishing some sort of predictability and trying to say that um, the presence that we now have on a rotational basis is, in a way, a new baseline for deterrence. We need to assure, we need to deter. This is what being allies is all about for us. So I also have to say that when it comes to discussing, discussing Russia, Norway has, for a long time, had a constructive relationship with Russia. We're neighbors, just like many of the others uh, and from other countries in the room here are. But we are under no illusions. We have a relationship based on two key issues from our side. That's firmness and predictability. Those two key words are really important. And secondly, we are under no illusions because we know that we have a very different history with Russia than many of the countries present here. We have had a peaceful border for over a thousand years. And that's a very different story from what Raimunds can tell us and others too. So I think we need to realize that even when the dust settles, even when the situation in Ukraine comes to some sort of a conclusion or a resolution, we're faced with a different Russia, we're faced with a different security policy situation in Europe. And I think that it's fair to say that what Russia has broken cannot be rebuilt in full. It is a different relationship. And then, as Tori said, and as Julian also mentioned, we needed at the summit to revitalize the transatlantic bonds. And I think they were revitalized. Uh, my feeling is that when we look back at our purpose and rationale, which is peace and security, sharing of the common values, NATO as a political alliance as much as a military alliance, I think that we came quite a long way. But I have to say, that in revitalizing the transatlantic bonds, we need to make sure that U.S. leadership and engagement is still a vital part of it. It's essential to actually having a transatlantic bond that can be strong enough to hold the times that we're in right now. And from our part, we have to, and I say this to, or we say this to our colleagues a lot, that we need to, from the European side, take more action, and we need to step up to the plate more than we've done so far. And that's not only when it comes to defense spending, which of course was a huge issue and topic at the summit as well. The 2% and the 20% goals, they're really important, and they're long-term goals. 
at the same time, we need to focus on what we're doing today, and we need to focus on filling the capability gaps that we do see. Uh, I'm really, uh, I, I think that what Latvia is doing right now, uh, pledging for uh, increases over the next five years, is really important, it's a very good signal, and I think we should all, in a way, look to Latvia uh, to a certain extent. But I, lastly, I would just like to say that although we focus much on NATO as a political alliance and also as military alliance, in order to be a credible and good political alliance, we also need to be a capable military alliance. Those two are very closely linked. And I think that what we're seeing today with our firm support for the Readiness Action Plan and many of the other initiatives taken both before and during the summit, I think we will see an alliance that is much more ready to do the things that an alliance could be asked to do if it comes to that situation. I think that we have put our allies closer together. We're much more on the same page. And I think that we came out of the summit a lot stronger than we went into the summit. And I do think and I do hope that we will see that same path forward as well. <coughs> Merkel was here just under a month ago, and she pledged very uh, clearly that the Baltic countries should be protected against any kind of possible aggression from Russia. Norway takes the same position. We're in this together as 28 allies. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Wonderful discipline. <laughs> Wonderful discipline. Though I have to say, the, uh, the, I love disciplining politicians. This is great fun. <laughs> I have to say, the number of times in my life I've heard the words readiness, action, and plan in a NATO document, wow. I could get rich if it was a pound <laughs> for each time. So, security landscape changing, refocus on collective defense, joint exercises to re reassure and reinforce, a new relationship with Russia, firmness, uh, with predictability with Russia, and a transatlantic bond revitalized. You clearly believe that NATO passes the Riga test, is that correct? I do. Good. Yeah. Great to hear. <laughs> Minister, you'll be pleased by that indeed. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you. Oh, good evening. I fully agree with my colleague uh, and those who are saying that the summit in Wales uh, was an important turning point for, for NATO. Will it deliver and ensure long-term security uh, in Europe and protection of transatlantic interests uh, globally? It has uh, to be seen. I can say that since the beginning, uh, uh, our intention in Wales was to revitalize uh, the bond between Europe and the United, United States. And previously, we had a feeling of growing difference, differences in our priorities and underperformance of Europe when it comes uh, to defense capabilities and political will. However, it seems uh, that uh, to a certain extent these differences uh, were artificial and the crisis in Ukraine returned us back to the situation where we naturally uh, belong uh, to. Since regaining uh, independence for, for the Baltic states, it has been very clear that the transatlantic link and the U.S. presence uh, in the region are equally important uh, for our security as uh, our benefits provided by the European Union. <coughs> During the NATO summit, we achieved several very positive things. Uh, from one side, uh, we approve uh, it approved uh, NATO member states' commitment uh, to stop declining defense uh, budgets and to revise the trend uh, with aim to achieve 2% goal. The readiness action uh, plan, which has been approved uh, by the summit, uh, eventually will raise the alliance readiness and ability to act not only uh, to respond to, to the response of changing Russia, but also uh, emerging threat uh, in, the, in the region. On the other side, uh, 
the U US uh, has proven that it is serious about European security and US is back in Europe. And uh, what is particularly important for us, it is uh, US is back in the Baltic states. Uh, once again, I would like to stress uh, the importance of pledge of uh, two, two persons uh, of defense spending at the summit. I am aware that uh, there are some critics who say that it is not enough and progress should be uh, more faster. In this regard, I would argue uh, that most important thing uh, is that all decisions and particularly defense pledge were made unanimously by all member states, by 28 democracies, not autocracies. I think it's very, uh, it's, uh, that it's most important strength uh, of, of, uh, of uh, NATO. For us, it's a problem that uh, we had very different experience and uh, we had to learn from own, own mistakes as our defense system uh, was created from the scratch uh, in 1991. And from one side, it is clear that defense capabilities uh, cannot be created overnight. And from other side, it is important uh, to spend money uh, efficiently as the trust of society depends on it. I can say that uh, I certainly don't expect that NATO will be able to retire after Afghanistan and avoid all international uh, problems. On the contrary, I can say and I am convinced that the need to use military force will only grow as more and more our interest might be uh, challenged in, in the future. But simult uh, simultaneously, it is clear that uh, we will not be able to repeat neither Afghanistan nor Kosovo operation for many reasons. First of all, uh, it is long and resource-consuming nation-building uh, missions. And I believe that we should uh, find less demanding uh, exit strategies from this uh, toolbox. And finally, I can say that crisis in Ukraine gave another positive impetus uh, for solving long-standing problem between uh, NATO and EU. And the crisis has drawn uh, natural boundaries or division of labor between uh, these two organizations in crisis management that had tendency to duplicate uh, pre previously. Uh, the response of uh, North Atlantic Alliance uh, has underscored its hard power capacity and deterrence potential, but uh, the EU has demonstrated its powerful uh, tool of soft power and financial uh, mechanisms. Certainly, I think it gives uh, us a very solid ground to develop uh, and cement this complementary even uh, further on, including cyber, uh, cyber capabilities, strate strategic communications, and so on. Speaking about your question, uh, is uh, it's this Riga, Riga test? I can say that no citizens of Riga um, can sleep safe. But of course, it is a lot of uh, work to be done in order to give citizens of uh, Riga the same assurance uh, in long-term perspectives for five, 10, 15 years. Uh, firstly, I think we uh, have to invest considerably uh, more in our own defense and develop our capabilities. Secondly, we must implement the good decisions of the last uh, NATO summit. And of course, finally, I can say that we don't 
don't for, uh, we should not forget the events uh, in Ukraine uh, that these events have changed considerably all European security system and if we will ignore that then not only uh, citizens of Riga but also of Berlin will not be safe anymore. Thank you, Minister. Very clear statement, and uh, indeed. Of course, ultimately, uh, the Riga test is passed by a cooperative relationship with a cooperative Russia, and that clearly is the grand strategic objective. Uh, and you talked about the long term security of Europe globally. To some extent, what was missing from the summit declaration was this truly global understanding of NATO's place in the big picture. Because this is not just about Russia, it's about changing power in the world and how we respond to it. But I loved your idea about US leadership and European responsibility. That is the essential transatlantic contract. And we Europeans have to stand up to that obligation to our American and the Canadian allies. James, poor old James. James has suffered my stumbling over his surname for many, many years. <laughs> a patterai. I was practicing James before I came in, and I got it wrong, but that's normal. If was any consolation, I was recently introduced at a panel as Professor Julian Friendly Clinch. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So it could be worse. James. Uh, thank you, and don't feel too bad because even my own relatives say I don't pronounce my own name correctly. <laughs> fall, fall on the ground laughing when I try to say it, so don't worry. Uh, and I see from the Twitter feed that the main theme is uh, Julian disciplines everyone, so I will try to stay uh, within my time. Um, to answer your question on whether people can sleep soundly, I mean, you, you'd expect me to say yes, and I won't give just a, an all rosy answer, but I, I think in general the answer is yes, and uh, I might give also a, a few perspectives on why we need to keep working. But I, I do think it's important that we put things into uh, perspective, and it, it does come to answering your question. According to NATO, there is no immediate or impending major military threat to any NATO country. And so people can sleep calmly already for that reason. Yeah. Secondly, uh, we have in NATO the countries that spent the most on defense in the world, still, despite all the talk of cutbacks. And we have the most capable, most experienced, most interoperable military forces, certainly in NATO's history, maybe ever, as a result of Afghanistan and other operations. So we have a very strong foundation and reason for confidence. And I think we have to start from that basis. Secondly, I share very much the view of the ministers. I think the Wales summit was very valuable because it showed a, a real convergence again, and I think, oh, to be honest, it's again in strategic assessment amongst the allies, uh, sort of imposed on us. But in essence, when they look east, they all see uh, a Russia that is of great concern. Uh, why? Because it has given itself very publicly laws and policies which give itself the right to impose itself, including militarily, on any country where there are Russian passport, passport holders, Russian speakers, or whatever historic Russian lands means. Uh, and that's very worrying. They've also showed a willingness to employ it, and they've showed this new model, the hybrid model, ambiguous warfare. So this is not a short-term problem. It's not about Ukraine. It's a long-term problem, of which Ukraine is another symptom like Georgia was. So that's one thing, one area where the Allies have really come together in analysis. Second, of course, was the South. Uh, and the Norwegian minister mentioned it. Uh, there is this terrorist group, ISIS, uh, and uh, the, the risks of that, I think, are quite clear. But there was also a broad consensus that the South, the Mid and Middle East and North Africa in many regions is a sort of cocktail of open borders, weak governance, small arms and light weapons proliferation, extremist groups. Uh, and this problem too will not go away soon, requires our support, and will affect our security. So that's the second part. And what's I think very encouraging is both sides of the Atlantic share that view. 
the third thing that I find encouraging is that we took very concrete decisions to address these understandings. And the first one was very much on reassurance and deterrence, exactly as the minister said. And you know, it's been a little while since I think NATO focused on this, but we have muscle memory in this organization and we're back in the gym, uh, let's put it that way. Uh, so the reassurance action plan, no, let me start. First, there's input. Input is how much you spend on defense. And you mentioned the commitment, uh, and one of the firm commitments was to stop the fall in defense spending. That alone is a big commitment, and we will see many governments increase again. Second uh, is output. The reassurance action plan, you know, yes, you've heard all the words, but what does it mean? It means that here in the Baltic states and in Poland, we're putting in reception facilities for a very high readiness uh, rapidly, very rapidly deployable and substantial unit that can be anywhere in NATO in 48 hours. And then it'll be followed by the NATO response force within 30 days. And then that can be followed by everybody else. Uh, and those things are being developed right now. And I can tell you our, our top military commander just two days ago in the council turned to all the ambassadors and said, I know what each of you has and I'm coming to get it to put this uh, together. So he's already on it. Uh, so that will happen. We're looking very carefully at the hybrid model. And the reassurance action plan is designed also to take away one of the major elements of the hybrid model. Cyber attacks and um, economic attacks and infiltration are all very, very dangerous. What makes them very dangerous is the use of conventional military forces massed on the border or infiltrated in. If you take that away, then it's much easier for national governments in the EU to help deal with the other aspects. So this really helps deal with that. But as the minister said, we also took a decision that cyber uh, attacks can now be considered as part of collective defense. That's a big transition for us uh, and means a lot of work will now flow to help allies who come under cyber attacks. We took decisions on intelligence and surveillance, on ballistic missile defense, on major capabilities, I won't go into them, uh, on interoperability with our partners to help bring them in uh, to the fold. So I, I think a lot was done to show that, you know, as I say, we're, we're back in the gym. Finally, what do we still need to look for? Uh, what is still hard? One is, of course, as was discussed in the first panel, the economic climate is still very challenging. And it'll be hard for governments to move money away from healthcare and finance ministers will not want to do it. They never want to do it. Um, but what I think is, is new is that, uh, this is just my perspective, but I think for the first time since 2001, average people are nervous. Yep. They're nervous when they look east, they're nervous when they look south, and these threats are, aren't halfway around the world. They're right on our borders, right on our borders. And people understand that. And so I think parliaments and citizens will support increases in defense spending now, because it's about our security right here, as you say, sleeping safely in our beds. Long-term commitments, of course, you know, you used the word aim and you emphasized aim and the spending pledge. It's also the case that sitting governments cannot always make commitments for successive governments in future, so there has to be a little bit of wiggle room. But I believe that the foundation uh, is there. So overall, I, I think Yes, people can sleep well in their beds now, but I think based on the decisions we've taken, they'll be able to sleep securely in their beds in future as well. Thank you, James. I take your point about cut, stopping the decline. But let's face it, many NATO European militaries, if they cut any more, they might as well scrap a lot and put it into healthcare and education. We're that far down. And I look at Asia and look at the arms race in Asia, and it is truly frightening. It's not just about Russia. You have to see this in a, in a, in, in a global context. Would you go as far as to say at the Wales summit, we did move towards a radical reconception of collective defense in Article 5, where we have advanced deployable forces, cyber defense, missile defense, and other tools in a 21st century version and that in a sense, the, the Readiness Action Plan is a kind of reforger revisited, that we'd have Europeans being the first responders with a few of our American and Canadian colleagues, but ultimately the, the 7th Cavalry would ride over the hill from the United States. Is that the implication that's come out of Wales? 
Well, um, I wouldn't say a radical reconceptualization of Article 5, because as you know very well, and as I think everybody here knows, uh, Article 5 was drawn up to be that flexible. The fundamental commitment, attack against one, attack against all. Now, how do we interpret it? In the past, of course, we had to plan for massive tank battles in the central German plain. Uh, that's not what we're talking about anymore. So yes, it's a very diff different and more flexible way of ensuring reassurance, but I also agree it's about adaptation of the alliance. It's about changing what NATO was even 10 years ago to have, for example, a more visible presence here so that people are sure that when they uh, face a problem and they turn around, NATO's going to be standing right there with them, and all 28 will be standing right there with them. Thank you. Ariel, you've heard three, in effect, European, the James is a kind of inherited European these days. And, uh, you know, we're very good at convincing ourselves that weak is strong and that soft is hard. Does this make any sense to you? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> um, before uh, I uh, answer the question about the uh, Riga test, um, what, where I agree uh, with James is that you have to look both east and south at the same time. And these are disparate challenges, but they're still challenges of our physical security, of our ideas, because what comes as, as alternatives, more so in the south than in the east, is a fundamental change about who we are and what we stand for. So let's start with that. The second issue is when you look at the challenge from the East, uh, you see for the first time, uh, at least uh, since the end of the Cold War, and uh, I would uh, dare to go back to 1975 Helsinki Accords, and even further back to the end of the uh, World War II, and say this is a challenge for the European security system as we know it. And people come to me and say, but what about Budapest 1956, the Soviet invasion? What about Prague 1968? And I say, well, there was a pretty explicit understanding where the spheres of influence were. And President Eisenhower and President Johnson clearly did not want to intervene uh, in Budapest and in um, uh, in Prague and before the 1953 Berlin because the agreements were made at the end of World War II. Here, no agreements were made after the collapse of the Soviet Union. In fact, we thought everybody is going to get together and that we're not uh, mutual friends and competitors any, any longer. Well, gee, uh, these agreements, these treaties, were violated in addition to the Budapest uh, 94 protocol and uh, the uh, international law, as weak as it is, uh, was violated uh, and the territory of a sovereign member of the UN occupied and continues to be occupied. Now, it's all very well. We can pretend nothing happened and continue on our merry way. And in discussions earlier today, in some cases, I heard that that's pretty much the approach. Let's just tweak the process a little bit. Let's, uh, called, uh, let's, call, um, uh, let's call it a disagreement. And let's agree to disagree. No, it's not going to work that way, just as it's not going to work that way in the South. And I think that the approach of getting uh, people from the region in the South, the 10 Arab countries, to get uh, engaged in uh, opposing the Islamic State uh, is just as important as uh, hopefully an agreement of the Europeans to be more engaged in Europe and to be more engaged in Europe will require not just <coughs> freezing the, the military expenses where they are, not just increasing it to 2% inshallah in 10 years, but also reconceptualizing the, nat the nature of this competition, of this conflict. It is not any longer a conventional 20th century armored division into the Fulda Gap conflict. It is about information operations, it is about energy, something I want to talk about, it is about economics, 
And when you look at the GDP of the EU and the United States combined, 34 trillion dollars, when you look at the population, uh, 700 uh, million combined, this is way, way higher than anything the other side uh, with the Eurasian Union or without the Eurasian Union uh, is going to counter oppose uh, to the Western Alliance. And frankly, I am not convinced that uh, much Bollywood um, alliance between Russia and China is real. In fact, I think it's not. In fact, I think those who protested so much about not turning Russia into the mineral wealth appendage of Europe now is to, are turning Russia into the mineral wealth appendage of China. Uh, quickly about energy and uh, information. As I said, uh, these is a multifaceted uh, competition, multifaceted conflict. Um, and um, the new type of hybrid warfare everybody is so exercised about is just one aspect of it. This is still a hybrid warfare. The conflict, unfortunately, is much, much broader. <coughs> and people as different as Winston Churchill, Adolf Hitler, and Ronald Reagan understood that energy uh, is a key uh, component of any kind of geopolitical competition. Churchill, in switching the uh, Royal Navy from coal to oil, Hitler, by desperately making a mad dash to Baku, which, thank God, he was defeated, and Reagan by emphasizing energy prices back in the 1980s. I think the overwhelming natural gas dependence of Europe uh, today, uh, 160 billion cubic meters BCM out of over 500 uh, billion cubic meters, uh, is indeed intolerable and is a challenge to European collective sovereignty and security. There's plenty of natural ga gas to go around. Going uh, clockwise uh, from the Caspian, Turkmenistan, Iran eventually after the outstanding nuclear issue uh, is settled. Uh, Northern Iraq, Kurdistan. Eastern Med, Cyprus, Israel, and whatever else is there on the shelf. Uh, Algeria, uh, pipe gas. And then further around Africa. Uh, Nigeria offshore, Angola offshore, Mozambique. You, you look at Norway, uh, you look at it by 2020, from 160 BCM that Europe is dependent on Russia today, you can go probably rather successfully to 100 BCM dependence, and then eventually by 2025, 2030, 60 BCM dependence, so that the wealth is spread, so that not one single supplier can hold uh, Europe by its uh, energy uh, tether, shall we say. Uh, lastly, information uh, warfare. Information today is as important as tanks and aircraft and drones and battle robots. It's important because people creatively apply the wisdom of Sun Tzu that the greatest art of defeating the enemy is defeating the enemy without fi uh, firing a shot, uh, is defeating through demoralizing, through questioning uh, the, the values and the goals of the perceived uh, opponent. Uh, and deployment of massive uh, information tools, RT, Russia Today, uh, in uh, English, Spanish, Arabic, and I think German is coming. Uh, when, by the way, RT wanted to do broadcasts in Chinese, there was a phone call from the Central Committee in Beijing to Moscow saying, we don't think it's uh, productive, and there is no Chinese RT, yes, sir. Um, uh, the deployment of cultural uh, diplomatic tools as one of the engineers or architects of this uh, scheme of deploying um, uh, cultural centers, so-called, and language centers around the world, said, well, then we can grow our own fifth column, quote, unquote. I heard it myself. And I was frankly shocked 
about the blunt, bluntness uh, with which it was said. Um, we are nowhere near where we used to be in the Cold War with international broadcasting, with uh, encouragement of uh, a variety of opinions in literature, in history, in art. We used to do it very well, and we totally abandoned the field. Yes, uh, it used to be not ideological, but if you read Alexander Dugin, the ideologue of the renewal of the Russian Empire, if you read other people like that, you find out it's becoming ideological, very much so. Why? Because the alternative, voice, alternative voices are no longer allowed to play at the same playing field. When you switch on a Russian TV channel, you will find there Dugin, Alexander Prokhanov, nicknamed uh, the Nightingale of the General Staff, but you will not find people who uh, analyze the world in, in terms you, you and I can agree to. And in fact, some of these people are here in, uh, in this audience now, either semi-exiled from their countries or uh, developing their careers overseas because their homeland no longer accepts them. So information in terms of the 21st century, not a central broadcasting a la BBC in World War II, but uh, a, a networked uh, information that both presents um, a picture that is an alternative picture to uh, Russian TV channels, and also um, in Central and Eastern Europe, and in Western Europe for that matter, present um, uh, a clear um, picture and in some cases advocacy of what this is about, what this is about, what we stand for, uh, and how uh, we can win. Uh, I think this is uh, very much needed. Uh, this is not thought through. Um, One minute, Ariel, please. Yeah. And this is something I suggest the United States and Latvia and Norway and other countries can and should work together. Without that, uh, we will be limited to old thinking and not necessarily are going to win. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariel. <laughs> Ariel, I've, I've got some good news and some good bad news for you. <laughs> um, the good news is that there's meant to be an awful lot of shale oil and gas under Lancashire. Now, as a Yorkshireman, I've always wanted to dig up Lancashire, and now's my chance. The good bad news concerns American energy self-sufficiency. International Energy Agency says that by 2025, the United States could be energy self-sufficient. How will that play on the hill if NATO allies are not pulling their weight on the American political scene? It's funny because sometimes what, what you're saying is the blessing uh, can be a curse. Yeah. Or what, is, what is good uh, for one set of actors such as independent energy companies in the United States who were more agile than the large multinationals developing technology, developing business models for shale, gas, and oil uh, in North America, not just US, also Canada, uh, is not necessarily good for, transatlantic, for the transatlantic relationship. What do you think? Um, I think that this is, this is incumbent on this audience, on the European countries, on NATO, on the EU, to strengthen the North Atlantic link. Yes. Of course, and I'm not disclosing here any secrets, the strengths of the isolationist wings in the United States, of both the Democrat Party and the Republican Party, the strength is growing. But it is the preservation of this unique connection that provided us with unprecedented prosperity since the end of World War II is what's going to keep it, preserve it, develop it, and that probably includes um, a more liberal uh, regime for uh, shale uh, oil and gas development in Europe as well. Thank you, Ariel. I'm going to open the floor now. I'm going to take three questions at a time, two from the audience and one from the Twitter sphere. So, sir, you're first. You, sir. Red tie. Yeah. 
there's a mic heading your way in a fairly uncertain manner. <laughs> Thank you, Hamid Lajavardi. Uh, there's a saying that the military is always fighting or responding to the last war. So we've had uh, Georgia, Abkhazia, and North Ossetia taken by actual direct military force. In Ukraine, we have the little green men creeping in. And what I'm concerned about is maybe the next wave, uh, and I'd like a response from the panelists, if I may. Uh, first, to understand the expansionist uh, tendencies of Russia historically is really important to uh, what I'm trying to ask. Um, and the next question really is, or the next Can you make idea. it one question, please, Yes, sir. it's only one question. Thank you. Uh, the next wave could be creeping economic and political infiltration, and maybe media, to take over a country. So no direct military attack, no little green man, but economic, political infiltration with special interests supporting that. Uh, can we sleep well at night, given that very real possibility, which I believe is in the process today? Uh, please, your response. Thank you. When you ask, ask your question, please say who you are. The woman on towards the back there, blonde hair. Yes, right where you are with the mic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anna Wieslander. I'm from the Institute of International Affairs in Stockholm. And I have a question, um, I think, mostly to Ine Eriksson Sörede. Uh, it would be interesting to hear your view on the future of Nordic defense cooperation in light of this uh, changing security environment and also given the fact that both Sweden and Finland are military non-aligned. Thank you. Right, I'm going to take one question from the Twitter sphere, from Hans Kundnani. Is NATO equipped to deal with irregular and hybrid warfare designed to circumvent Article 5? And I'm going to link that with our first question here about political infiltration. James, why don't you have a shot at those first two? Thanks. Um, and I sort of hinted at the answer, I think. Um, we've looked very carefully at the hybrid model as it has been employed and how as it could it be employed. And I think you all know the elements that we see, which are, as, as um, the, first, uh, the first person who asked the question uh, indicated, a combination of uh, substantial forces, conventional military forces massed on the border of Ukraine, the infiltration of regular military forces, they don't have badges, but we know who they are, uh, the infiltration of uh, special forces, infiltration of private military companies, infiltration of apparently soldiers on vacation. That was the excuse for when those guys were caught. Uh, they'd gone on vacation in eastern Ukraine. Um, but also uh, transfer of weapons, heavy weapons uh, included and cyber attack, economic attack, uh, very heavy psychological operations efforts, however you, information operations efforts, uh, and uh, engaging with disgruntled members of a minority. So these are all the things you can use in one way or another. And NATO doesn't have the answer to all of these things. So uh, what you'll see in the summit communique, which is our longest ever, so you can take your time while Tell reading me about it, it. <laughs> uh, it, it has a couple of elements, and one I already mentioned. Having analyzed this, there are things that NATO can do, there are things that national governments can do, and there are things that EU can do. And one of the conclusions we've come to is, of course, we need to work much more closely together, and everybody needs to do their part. That's point one. Uh, and we are already talking to the European Union, for example, to see as organization to organization who can do what best and how we can make sure that these things link up. The second point I would make is that what makes all of these non-military elements more effective is the military part, uh, as I hinted before. If you can keep out the heavy weapons, if you can keep out the regular forces, if you can keep out the irregular forces, and if you can mass just as fast and just as many forces on your side of the border to exclude the possibility of a major conventional uh, intervention, then 
the cyber attack becomes much more manageable. The economic cutoffs become much more manageable for the host country and for the European Union to manage. It's when they're all part of the same package. What about the political side of this? We're, we're all missing the fact that there hasn't been an attempt to destabilize Kiev per se in Ukraine politically. But one could envisage future conflicts in which there's a, a, a clear effort to destabilize the seat of government of an opposing country in line with this kind of um, um, ambiguous warfare. There is always that possibility, but I think it's important to remember that no NATO country, this is my view, but no NATO country is as susceptible as Ukraine is and was to this kind of pressure. Why? Because there were huge economic problems, a very weak military, despite all the attempts and efforts we've made to help them, real concerns about corruption, which the new government is trying to address. People in the East did not feel, and in other parts of Ukraine, felt disaffected and didn't feel that the political system, including because of corruption, represented them. Uh, we don't have these problems in NATO countries. We have strong democracies. People feel represented with strong militaries. Uh, so I, I don't think that any NATO country is as susceptible to that kind of disruption, uh, that kind of hybrid warfare as, uh, as Ukraine, unfortunately, was. Thank you, James. Minister, uh, maybe you'd like to have a crack at that Nordic question from our colleague from Stockholm. Absolutely. Uh, I would also like to add something to what James said, but I can take that later. Uh, well, I think that the future of the Nordic Defence Corporation is bright, and I think part of the reason is, uh, or is twofold. One of the reasons uh, is that NATO also likes to enhance partnerships with for instance, Sweden and Finland now. You signed during uh, the summit a host nation support agreement, which is a huge step both for Sweden and Finland. And we've been together in operations, we're interoperable, and you are enhanced partners, and that is something that we value strongly. And for NATO's sake, I think also the fact that uh, now regional corporations with partners are no longer something that you would not like to talk about. It's something that you would like to, to enhance and cherish, which is, a, which is a difference. And secondly, uh, now also speaking as, uh, as the country uh, currently holding the, the chair of NORDEFCO, the Nordic Defense Corporation, is that when the discussion on the solidarity clause was ended, it was a huge leap forward for the Nordic Defense Corporation because there was no longer any kind of doubt as to what primary security policy affiliations the different countries had. So I think that was, that was kind of vital in, in pushing it forward. And we're cooperating, I would say, very well on different areas right now. And many of the initiatives that we're discussing within NATO at the moment has some sort of roots in a Nordic Defense Corporation. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, what we just signed, um, the Precision Guided Munitions Agreement uh, was also part of a Danish initiative, so it's, it's kind of, we're, we're getting there. I would just like to add one thing to James, if I may. Please, absolutely. Since I was so disciplined earlier on, I think I need to get some bonus <laughs> Hugely points. Hugely impressive, I yeah. might add. <laughs> well, I, I think that when we discuss <laughs> hybrid warfare or discuss the, the unconventional means, I think that we have to keep in mind with Ukraine that what made the unconventional means effective was the military, the conventional pressure on the outside of the border, mm -hmm. knowing that they had gathered conventional forces at quite a high speed. Yeah. Uh, unlike things they've done before, they being the Russians. And of course, that pressure mounted to the pressure mm -hmm. on the inside and made it, of course, easier to be effective with, with um, um, the unconventional forces. And I think that regardless of the threat that NATO could face, which can be, I mean, the, the threats now are so much more complex than they used to be. And, and the warning time is now down to almost zero for many of the threats that we're facing. So regardless of the threat, we need to keep situational awareness. I think that that's key to actually being able to respond to any kind of threat. And we need to politically, we're not good at that, but politically we also need to call the bluff. I mean, it's sometimes I say that if it walks like a duck and looks like a duck, it most probably is a duck. And we have to talk about these things and, and actually call the bluff of, of that unconventional warfare as well. Ariel, quick intervention if you would, sir. Thank you. Well, if you are to call the bluff, as you said, of the unconventional warfare, uh, A, somebody needs to analyze what this is. Uh, we are in pretty much uncharted waters. Uh, we have some general principles of warfare, uh, I mentioned Sun Tzu before, and others. 
but in terms of these combined operations that spread beyond air, land, uh, and navy to information, <coughs> economics, energy, etc., th this is pretty new stuff. And normally, it would be a nation state that would do it. I am familiar with American military. American military, in my view, has not uh, awakened yet. It's still thinking in terms of killing metal boxes, if you know what I mean. Uh, in Europe, who is going to do it? Who is going to design the response? Who is going to implement the response? In Russia, it's easy. You have the National Security uh, Council. You have intelligence services, military intelligence, and we've seen what they are capable of doing, and it's impressive. Who is going to do it in NATO? Is it going to be uh, Mr. Apaturai, or is it going to be uh, national uh, militaries, or is it going to where the security services element? So these are all new stuff. Uh, and another point here is while we are understandably looking at it from the NATO perspective, I think a rational analysis suggests that the next event or series of events are not going to be vis-a-vis -vis NATO. I'm not saying it will never happen. It will never happen. I'm not saying it will never happen in Narva or never happen in Latvia. But before that, the rational analysis suggests it will happen in Kazakhstan or in the Caucasus or in Belarus because the assumption is that what is mine is mine and what is yours we'll see later. So it is a reconsolidation of the post-Soviet area that will come first, unless it's stopped through economic sanctions and other means, and then we'll see. Right, Minister, do you want a quick word on, on this? Maybe a little bit add that, of course, uh, Russia still have strong geopolitical interest in post-Soviet territories, not only in Ukraine or Moldova, also in Georgia, uh, Kazakhstan, even in, in the Baltic countries. But uh, now we are speaking about hybrid wa warfare, about uh, military inter intervents, but uh, we must firstly answer to the question why it happens. It happens if country is weak, weak from economical point, weak fro from uh, also democratical point. If it's weak, weak democracy, it's possible such things happen. It means from our side we must strengthen our social economical uh, situation. If we will be economically strong, it will be very difficult to find the persons who will be ready to follow the green men's or to follow Russian uh, information warfare. It means we must strengthen our economic economy, we must strengthen our energy security and other issues. If we solve that, we will not speak about military. Thank you, Minister. It, it happens because history is about power. And the power never sleeps anywhere. Now, I have eight questions, 20 minutes, and I'm going to end on time. I'm going to close my list now. Madam, you've been very patient. Please. Concise questions, concise answers, please. Nadia Arbatova, uh, Institute for World Economy and International Relations, Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, our cooperation uh, with NATO has been frozen because of the conflict in Ukraine, but outside Europe we still share common interests, uh, like uh, the fight with uh, militant Islam, uh, anti-terrorist uh, operations, and uh, proliferation uh, of WMD. Uh, do you think that it is uh, possible in the current situation to maintain the key channels of interaction in this sphere. And about ideology, uh, it's not only Russian privilege to have ideologists. I remember that the former Secretary General uh, of NATO, Javier Salana, said at one of the NATO's conferences that the Westphalian system 
was replaced with two principles, humanity and democracy. But the Syrian case has shown that there can be deep contradiction between these two principles. What is more important for NATO? Um, regime change for the sake of democracy or um, elimination of WMD for the sake of humanity? Thank you, Nadia. Nice to see you again. Klaus Wittmann. And then you. Thank you. I'm General Klaus Wittmann, Senior Fellow at the Aspen Institute, Germany. Exactly five years ago, the late Ron Asmus, whom many of you uh, knew, and for others and myself, developed uh, an eight-page uh, paper with the title NATO, New Allies and Reassurance. And Ron and I had the chance in January 2010 in Prague to brief it to the Albright Group, and it contributed to rebalancing collective defense and out of area in the NATO strategic concept on paper, like the summit declaration. And uh, what we had in mind, of course, and what we advocated was visible reassurance. Now the paper is eerily topical again. And uh, if I look at the summit decisions, uh, I would say that now we belatedly take steps for securing our most vulnerable allies and solely as a result of Russian policy. We should have done it as a matter of routine long ago. And we still seem to do it somewhat reluctantly Question because they yes, I immediately, uh, because uh, they're uh, somewhat reluctantly because there is much concern not to provoke Russia. Although I would ho hold that nothing the Kremlin has done in the last nine months was provoked. Now I ask myself and put it in two questions to the panelists. Are we all self-confident enough to really do the necessary and are we capable of conveying to our publics and perhaps even to the public of Russia what is necessary? On arrival I met the head of the NATO Strategic Communications Center of Excellence and I think we still have to become much more excellent in strategic communication. Mm. Thank you, Klaus. Eerily topical. My wife would describe me as that. Um, the list is now closed. I'm not taking any more questions. I have a panel to manage. Third question on this group. Sir, you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Bakhtiar Aslan Bailey from Baku University. Uh, it's great to hear that the people in the NATO member countries could sleep well. Uh, and it's also great to hear that uh, there is no emerging uh, security concern for NATO member countries. Then the question is, what about the NATO partner countries? And there are a lot of the expert analysis recently regarding the potential face-saving option for the Kremlin in case, the, in case of failure in Ukraine. And among others, uh, NATO partner countries such as Moldova, Georgia, Azerbaijan are, NATO, are considered as potential object of that face-saving. So the question is to, probably to James actually, the, the question is, shall we expect any amendments, any adjustment to NATO strategy toward uh, partner, NATO partner countries in light of the already increased and unfortunately even further increasing security threat from our northern neighbor? Thank you very much. Right, panel. I have to land this panel on time, so concise answers, please. Minister Sarayda, would you like to start off with uh, this little group? I can, um, of course. Um, just... Starting off, we're trying to give a very, um, very quick answer to um, the first question. Outside of NATO and the, and the interests, I would like to um, direct some attention to how the relationship between Russia and Norway has uh, been ever since we also froze our military cooperation. We had a military cooperation because we are neighbors and have been developing this over years. Now we do not have it anymore, of obvious reasons. At the same time, we have put emphasis on keeping our Coast Guard cooperation, our Border Patrol cooperation, our incidents at sea, search and rescue, because it is about people's safety. 
At the same time, we've kept our lines between our military headquarters open in order to do something that I find very important in, in these circumstances, to avoid any kind of misunderstandings, because they can happen when, when the climate is like it is. So we try to, to keep those lines open. Uh, we cooperate on those issues where we have a common interest for the safety of our people. And of course, uh, there are always possibilities to cooperate uh, in other organizations like the UN. But I have to stress the fact that when, when NATO and Russia tried to form a strategic partnership, I would say a couple of decades ago, there has to be a mutual interest and mutual givings in that partnership. Otherwise, it is not a partnership. And now we do not have it. And I don't see, as I said in my opening statement, that we anytime soon will come back to any kind of normality. I think that this is a profoundly and actually, uh, I would say, a uh, change security policy situation that will not change over any kind of time that we can see in our horizons. We have a different Russia, a Russia that has shown not only the will, but now also the ability to use military means in order to gain their political ambitions. And that is what has changed so profoundly. And that is something that NATO as an alliance and the respective countries have to actually live to. Minister Verhonis, would you like to uh, comment on shared interest with Russia, Nadia Arbatova's point? Of course, <coughs> Russia uh, has this revisionist power, and uh, we can say that the uh, challenge of revisionist power on our borders adds to already existing terrorism, uh, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, regional conflicts, also state failure, uh, extremism and organized crime as fundamental threats and uh, dangers to our security. But, th th but in the same time, I can say that nobody will be able to solve our problems uh, and we have to seek uh, for the solutions uh, how to strengthen, first of all, our defense capabilities against against somebody, probably our neighbor, uh, and also strengthen cooperation between, between NATO countries. Together, these self-defense capabilities and uh, collective uh, principle helps the countries who are out of direct uh, influence by Russia, like Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, more, more better survive in this uh, situation. But I fully agree with uh, Representative from Batumi that uh, we sometimes forgot about, about uh, other, other countries who are partner countries uh, for, for NATO. And of course, it's very difficult to answer, uh, answer uh, how we can help uh, you. Because in reality, of course, we speak that many countries don't want to provoke Russia. And it sometimes doesn't help uh, to make any, any decisions. But the Ukraine case, uh, Ukraine situation, uh, in reality, help uh, NATO to wake up I hope that we will not sleep, sleep again, and it means that all these good decisions what we have in uh, Wales, we must implement, including these uh, advanced programs for, for Georgia. I'm going to crack on so we're on time, James. If you could take Klaus's question, and Ariel, take the question about our, from our colleague in Baku about partners, but quickly both, please, so I can get to the remaining questions. James. Well, I, I might not be as disciplined uh, because I think there are uh, two questions which um, relate directly to NATO which I wouldn't mind uh, tackling if you quickly please me. Yeah. I will one is on uh, the question from Ms. Arbatova uh, I think it's impossible uh, it's important not to underestimate the extent to which trust has been broken 
uh, and it is not possible in my view to isolate Ukraine and say we'll do all the other stuff. Uh, we're not going to repeat the Georgia scenario where after a few months everything drifts back to normal cooperation. Uh, and because we tried to integrate Russia into the na international system in a way that respected Russia uh, and its importance, the NATO-Russia Council, uh, but not just the NATO-Russia Council, the G8, the World Trade Organization, and it didn't work. Now we're in for, I think, a very difficult period of trying to find a way which provides predictability that, of course, countries here would like with Russia and we all want. So I think we're gone for a long period of, of difficulty now. Uh, in terms of NATO's partners uh, as special representative to the Caucasus, I couldn't let it go. Sure. Um, we had taken decisions in the past few months precisely to try to help the countries, uh, you know, the, use this line from a, a book recently, the places in between. What about the countries between us and Russia? We take care of ourselves, we freeze with Russia, but what about the rest? Russia clearly has a policy, a stated policy, to impose itself now on these countries, and we're trying to help, uh, including with Azerbaijan. Uh, we have a policy now to try to step up and focus our cooperation through defense capacity building through our partnership frameworks. Unfortunately, there's a difference between a member and a non-member, and Article 5 could never apply, but there is plenty of scope to do more together uh, with our partners, and, and they do know it. Harry. I think it's absolutely crucial that not just Brussels, not just NATO HQ, but Washington as well, will recognize what's at stake uh, in the post-Soviet space, will be committed, will not pass platitudes for policy, will not pass disengagement for policy, uh, and uh, will read uh, a geopolitical map in an unflinching way. There were too many platitudes that I heard including from the highest level, that I do not even want to repeat here, uh, that jeopardized the sovereignty and security of our partners. Thank you. And no, Baku does not pass the Riga test, nor, do, nor does Tbilisi, and nor does Astana. I'm sorry to say that. But very clear. Right, the last three questions, concise please. The woman at the back who's been very patient. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Elena Krisilova, University of Kent. Um, while all honorable speakers uh, were giving their opinions, I was busily Googling um, Oxford Dictionary just to establish the difference, nuance difference between reassurance and deterrent. So reassurance actually means commitment to action of removing one's fears or doubts. Deterrent actually something more tangible. It is a tangible thing that discourages from doing wrong. So my question is here, we spoke a lot about uh, reassurances here as a result of NATO, Wales, uh, Wales NATO summit. So, but how can we effectively discourage Russia from taking hold in Crimea, from staying, let's say, in um, Donetsk, Luhansk, Mariupol, etc. perhaps as a prospective even peace force. What deterrence do we have, or will we have, in place to unwind the reality? Thank you. Mm. Question, gentlemen here. Ouch. Um, Andrea Larion of KTNC. My first question to the uh, Minister of Defense of Norway. Um, I'm a little bit puzzled by your statement, uh, quote, uh, what Mr. Putin has broken cannot be rebuilt in full. Among those that has been broken are peace in Europe, territorial integrity of Ukraine, world order, international system of relations, uh, some kind of uh, guarantees of territorial integrity of non-nuclear state, and so on. Should we consider from your statement that the position of Norway and NATO is tacit acceptance that all these that have been broken will not be rebuilt in full? Uh, second question related to what is being discussed, please. Julian, it is your point about the Riga test. I think Riga test is pretty easy, especially after the comments of uh, President Obama. Let's move, uh, reformulate to what people already started to do. Let's take Daugavpils test, Latgalia test, Narva test, 
Astana test, Baku test, Tbilisi test, and definitely Kharkiv test, Donetsk test, Luhansk test, Crimea test. Should we say right now, especially picking up from Ariel's comment, uh, that uh, after the Second World War, there was a very clear line that should not be crossed by both sides. And now, after, let's say, end of the Cold War, there is no light that has been uh, set up clearly. And now Mr. Putin is some kind of establishing de facto a new line. And NATO is definitely your accepting second, your second this new line. Yes, new line. That eastern border of NATO countries is a new line. And what is east to the eastern border of NATO countries is something that uh, belongs to the sphere of privileged interests of Kremlin. Should we understand it like this? Thank you. And front row, please. Whilst the mic is coming down, I've been asked to apologize on behalf of the organizers that we have slight problems with the internet, which we fixed ASAP. OK. So, Vladimir so you have it. <laughs> Vladimir Sokol, Jamestown Foundation. Connecting with General Wittmann's question and with a follow-up question about deterrence. My question to the entire panel. What is your interpretation of the NATO-Russia Founding Act? Thank you. Good question. Final question. I'm going to run down the panel in reverse order. We have five minutes. Ariel, answer the questions. Give a final comment. Thank you. First, uh, I think that an earnest attempt is made to recreate uh, or create a sphere of privileged interests. This should not come as a surprise. This should, nobody should have the audacity to call it as a black swan because this was uh, in the speech by the Russian president. Not President Putin, President Medvedev, in the televised address on the 30th of August, 2008, right after, <coughs> Ger uh, after Georgia. So, yes, this is an attempt that is being made, whether it's going to be successful and at what price. We just read today that there's an attempt to ban imports of Western cars, including used cars, imports of Western clothes, imports of Western uh, cheeses, and Norway salmon was given an exception, I understand, for reasons I can comment on later, but is this back to the USSR? Is this the Beatles song that I'm hearing? I don't know yet. Secondly, uh, in terms of what we can do or not do with um, our NATO partners and others in the former Soviet Union, I think there was a decision made uh, around 2009, more specifically in the first part, of 2009 in Washington at the highest level to make Mr. Putin feel more comfortable, to demonstrate that we are, as the Russians would say, white and fluffy, and we're not threatening in any way. And we thought that Russia will step up to the plate and take more responsibility for a, as a regional security provider. And what we got in 2014 in Ukraine is the outcome. It was not the intended outcome. It was the shape of the reset. And now we have to eat it. James. You, yeah. James. I have to eat it. Apparently. Follow that. <laughs> um, four quick lines. One is... Uh, when it comes to Ukraine and rolling back reality, I think that's an excellent way of phrasing it, unwinding reality. Uh, honestly, I don't think it's going to be for NATO to unwind the reality. Uh, it is the pressure being put by the European Union and the sanctions and all the other steps being taken politically and economically. But uh, neither Ukraine nor any NATO country thinks that it's a good idea to deploy NATO forces into Ukraine to fight Russian forces or irregular forces. So. You know, we can do what we can do at NATO, but I think uh, other organizations and groupings will, like the United States, is core, of course, uh, as part of that, need to do what they have to do. But I'm not that hopeful about Crimea being unwound anytime soon. Uh, 
But then that brings us to the next point. Are we accepting the reality? No, we are not accepting uh, that uh, Russia gets to just impose itself uh, on, on its neighbors. And uh, I, I want to use Ukraine as an example that NATO fully respects the right of countries to choose their orientation. Uh, Ukraine wanted to be a NATO member, then they changed their policy to become uh, non-bloc or non-aligned. We did, had more cooperation with Ukraine after they took that decision than before. But what we want is to do our best to help the countries between <laughs> us and Russia or the countries feeling this pressure to be able to make their own choice and then let them choose. But we will not impose ourselves on them. We will also not abandon them. So we will do our best to help them be strong states that can take their own decisions. Uh, and that's through all our partnership work. The NATO-Russia founding act, the relationship with Russia, I think this is a big question. And the bottom line is this, all the NATO countries want a good and trusting cooperative relationship with Russia, a strategic partnership. That's our policy and we actually proved it through the structures that we put in place. Uh, again, I don't speak, uh, it's not an agreed NATO line, but the bottom line for me is Russia doesn't want it. They don't want partnership with NATO and they have a project to overturn the arrangements that have been put in place for the last 20 years, which they resent, uh, which they think don't recognize their right to have influence on their neighbors, the historic right which for hundreds of years Russia has exercised. So we are in a sort of uh, ideological and political struggle because the EU project and the NATO open door are in opposition to uh, what Russia wants now. They want to unpick what has been built over the last 20 years. So we can't just think this will stop because it's not in line with what Russia wants today. And that, then I come to my final point, uh, and it wasn't raised here, but I think sitting here in this country and listening to this discussion, we can't forget the importance of NATO's open door. The reason the citizens of this country sleep safely is because they're in the EU and because they're in NATO and we need to keep the door open to new countries. Thank you, James. Minister. Okay, it is a question of here, interpretation, here. but I can say that Russian NATO founding act isn't actual at present moment. The Wales summit took uh, right decisions. According to existing Russian NATO uh, founding act, and now we have to implement uh, these decisions. The good news, is that our rivals uh, understand very well uh, that NATO solidarity and transatlantic partnership is our fundamental, fundamental uh, tool. They know that uh, it is our biggest strength and uh, they, of course, test it time, time to time. But I should undermine uh, their temptation and show that our ties are in unbendable and our commitments in NATO are ironclad, as President Obama mentioned it. Thank you, sir. This is Sarada. Well, just a couple of quick points. First, I want to echo what James just said about uh, the Founding Act and, and also the relationship between uh, Russia and NATO. And I do think that it's important to remember that when the Founding Act was established, it had one clear prerequisite. It was going to be valid in the security situation or environment of today and the foreseeable future. And that has changed dramatically. And that does not mean that NATO puts aside the Founding Act. On the contrary, I would say that all the measures that NATO has been uh, deciding on now during the summit are well within the Founding Act, so that's not the discussion. But the point is that one always tends to forget the discussion on what kind of, of circumstances and climate the Founding Act was done in, and that has changed quite, quite dramatically. Then secondly, to the question of um, what Russia has broken cannot be rebuilt in full. Well, overall, I don't see that there is any doubt that what Russia has done and is continuing to do towards its neighbors and also trying to scare NATO countries on, in, in the East is something that has broken the trust that we need in order to be 
partners in order to have a strategic partnership. It is no doubt in my mind that it has also, um, that the partnership that we all in a way relied on was, was some sort of a foundation now is not there anymore. And, and, and I think that no matter what happens, as I've said a couple of times now, we are faced with a different security policy situation. We are faced with a different Russia. And that cannot be rebuilt in full. I have not heard any one of our colleagues in NATO or anywhere else saying that they think that the relationship between themselves and Russia or NATO and Russia will go back to normal and the way things were. We're not in that situation. And that's what I mean with saying that what has been broken cannot be rebuilt in full. Thank you all. I'm not unusually for me going to conclude with some long, pompous statement. <laughs> um, but I do have three points. My overarching point is that the transatlantic relationship, the bond, if you like, about which we've been discussing, is essentially about grand strategic power and grand strategic values. It's big. It succeeds when it thinks big about a big world. We must have the level, level of ambition. Wales was a beginning, but it was only a beginning. The context has changed. No more strategic uh, vocation, no more strategic pretense. Second, the transatlantic contract. There's a new contract implicit in Wales that you must understand. The defense of all is guaranteed by the most powerful countries in the alliance in return for a sharing of the responsibilities, their responsibilities. No more red cards, no more national caveats, no more excuses that endlessly mean a few nations are the few nations standing together at the point of contact with danger. If we do not share risk, then the alliance will fade and die. Make no mistake about that. And my final point concerns our ability to think radically. We will have to radically reconceive the organization of power, structure, and indeed mindset if we are to strike a balance between strategy, capability, and affordability. There was some mention of that at Wales, but it went nothing like far enough. So I leave you with two questions that I think will dominate the next day or so. And these questions are quite simple. Given what's out there, are we collectively up to it? And are we collectively up to it together? No more politics. We need strategy and we need commitment now. I'd like you to join me in thanking a wonderful panel for their excitement. Thank you.